This is Professor Nicholson lecturing on normal physiologic changes in the mother and fetus during pregnancy. Please review Unit 3, Module 1, Subcompetencies on your own. Fetal development during pregnancy is measured in the number of weeks after fertilization, which is a duration of 40 weeks or 9 months. This slide presents the stages of fetal development. The first is the zygotic stage, which is the fertilization of sperm and egg, or you can also call that an ovum, through the second week. This is also called conception. Blastocyst stage is when the zygote divides into a solid ball of cells and attaches to the uterus. The embryonic stage is when major structures and organs begin to emerge by the second week through the eighth week. The fetal stage is when those structures are differentiated and this start by the eight, starts excuse me, by the eighth week until birth. As you can see, this is why prenatal vitamins are an important supplement during pregnancy. You need to know that the embryonic period of development is the development of basic organ systems. It begins with the fusion of the oocyte, also known as the developing egg, and sperm cell. This eventually differentiates into three germ layers. Some cells become the embryo, while others become the membranes that surround and protect it. The ectoderm layer forms the central nervous system, special senses, skin, and glands. The mesoderm layer forms the skeletal, urinary, circulatory, and reproductive organs. And lastly, the endoderm layer forms the respiratory system, liver, pancreas, and digestive system. These are all formed at the same time as the embryonic membranes. All tissues and organ systems develop from these three layers. It's amazing how several weeks will pass during this process, even before those quote unquote, quote, presumptive signs of pregnancy, as we will discuss shortly. Table 10.1 in your Ritchie text has a great visual of the embryonic and fetal development week by week. This slide has just a small amount of what is in your textbook, and it's reflective to your subcompetencies. However, I will stress you to know the following. At 20 weeks, vernix appears on the fetus, and this is also the time when the fetus has an audible heartbeat. During the third trimester, this is when subcutaneous fat is deposited. The placenta serves as the interface between the mother and the fetus. This slide shows the important functions of the placenta during pregnancy. I highly suggest that you review this slide very carefully. Hormones produced by the placenta. Please know that the human chorionic gonadotropin, which is also known as HCG hormone, stimulates the corpus luteum. A refresher, in case you do not recall what the corpus luteum is, it produces the hormone progesterone that makes your uterus a healthy environment for a developing fetus. A new corpus luteum forms each time you ovulate and breaks down once you no longer meet, need it to make progesterone. The umbilical cord is formed from the amnion, which is a thin, tough membrane that protects the fetus. It is a lifeline from the mother to the growing embryo. It has one large vein and two small arteries. A way to remember this is a smiley face. The eyes are the arteries and the mouth is the vein. Or in my way, I think of the name Ava. The A's are for the arteries and the V is for the vein. The umbilical cord is surrounded by Wharton jelly, and this prevents compression on the arteries and vein. On average, a term umbilical cord is 22 inches long and 1 inch wide. That's just an average. You do need to know that the umbilical vein carries oxygen oxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus. The umbilical arteries carry deoxygenated blood from the fetal circulation to the placenta. 
Amniotic fluid surrounds the embryo and increases in volume as pregnancy progresses. It reaches approximately one liter at term. It is derived from fluid transported from the maternal blood across the amnion and fetal urine. Its volume changes as the fetus swallows and voids. It is composed of 98% water and 2% organic matter. Adequate volume is necessary for proper, proper excuse me, fetal growth and development. You may hear the term oligohydramnios, which means too little amniotic fluid, or polyhydramnios, which means too much amniotic fluid as you observe labor units. I will not go in depth with these. However, you will find these come with potential complications. I will not read this slide in its entirety. However, I highly suggest you review this very carefully as you need to know these major roles of the amniotic fluid. I have discussed fetal circulation in a previous lecture this semester, so please review this. This is the blood flow from the placenta to and through the fetus and then back to the placenta. There are three shunts during fetal life. The ductus venosus, which connects the umbilical vein to the inferior vena cava. This bypasses the liver. The ductus arteriosus, which connects the main pulmonary artery to the aorta. This bypasses the lungs. And the foramen oval, which is an anatomic opening between the right and left atrium. This bypasses the right ventricle. There is a great file within this module tab that has images to help with your review. The 11.4 table in your Ritchie text is a great source to study these physiologic and anatomic changes in the expectant mother. Regarding the endocrine system, this controls the integrity and duration of gestation by maintaining the corpus luteum. A lot of hormones are involved with this process. Regarding the uterus, it increases in strength and elasticity to allow the uterus to contract and expel the fetus during birth. Regarding the breasts, an increase in size and areolar pigmentation occurs. Regarding the cardiovascular system, this occurs early during pregnancy to meet the demands of the enlarging uterus and the placenta for more blood and more oxygen. An increase in blood volume occurs by approximately 1,500 milliliters, or up to 50% above non-pregnant levels. This supports the placenta and arteriovenous shunt in the maternal vascular compartment. You need to know the physiologic cause of varicosities in the lower extremities and vulva is due to the compression of the abdominal veins by the progressively enlarged uterus. Regarding the respiratory system, the amount of space available to house the lungs decreases as the uterus puts pressure on the diaphragm. This causes a pregnant woman to breathe faster and more deeply because she and the fetus need more oxygen. Moving on to the GI system, smooth muscle relaxation and decreased peristalsis occurs related to the increase of excuse me, the influence of elevated progesterone levels. This results in delayed gastric emptying and decreased peristalsis. Regarding the urinary system, hormonal changes increase blood flow to the kidneys. The biggest structural change in the renal system during pregnancy is dilation of the renal pelvis and the uterus. Regarding the integumentary system, most women experience hyperpigmentation during early pregnancy due to hormone fluctuations, typically generalized and mild. Many pregnant women express concern about stretch marks, also called striae, as well as skin color changes and possible hair loss. Many women experience the pigmentation that extends from the umbilicus to the pubic area. This is called the linea nigra, and I have a picture of that right here on the slide. Lastly, the musculoskeletal system. Postural changes occur during pregnancy. The woman has an increased sway back due to the enlarging uterus. The loosening of the sacroiliac 
iliac, excuse me, sacroiliac joints could cause lower back pain. The hormones progesterone and relaxin have an influence on the pelvic joints as it supports the growing fetus. There is also an increase in the lumbosacral curve, leading to a waddling gait. Presumptive signs of pregnancy are those signs that the mother can perceive. The most obvious is the absence of menstruation. Skipping a period is not a reliable sign of pregnancy by itself, but if it is accompanied by consistent nausea, fatigue, breast tenderness, and urinary frequency, pregnancy may be likely. Presumptive changes are the least reliable indicators of pregnancy because any one of them can be caused by conditions other than pregnancy, such as amenorrhea, GI disorders, cancer, oral contraceptives, etc. Probable signs of pregnancy are those that can be detected on physical examination by a health care provider. Ballotment is when the examiner pushes against the woman's cervix during a pelvic examination and feels a rebound from the floating fetus. This is around 16 to 28 weeks. The Goodell sign is softening of the cervix, which is around five weeks. The Heger sign is softening of the lower uterine segment or the isthmus around 6 to 12 weeks. And the Chadwick sign is a bluish purple coloration of the vaginal mucosa and cervix, which occurs during weeks 6 through 8. Checkpoint. Although I did not discuss this in any of my previous slides, this is within your textbook and something you should know. What gestational age can an ultrasound assess gender? The answer here is C, 16 weeks. And just a heads up, a transvaginal ultrasound may be performed in the first trimester to confirm the pregnancy, but that cannot determine the gender. Only an ultrasound around 16 weeks can. Positive signs of pregnancy. This is usually within two weeks after a missed menses. Enough subjective symptoms are present so that a woman can reasonably be sure that she is pregnant. However, an experienced healthcare provider is the one who can confirm it. Positive signs of pregnancy confirm that a fetus is growing in the uterus. Visualizing the fetus by ultrasound, Palpating for fetal movements and hearing a heartbeat are all signs that make a pregnancy certain. If the pregnancy test is positive, a visit should be established so that the estimated gestational age can be determined. Patients should receive information such as normal signs and symptoms of early pregnancy and be instructed on when to call regarding concerns. Once pregnancy has been confirmed, the healthcare provider will set up a schedule of prenatal visits to assess the woman and her fetus throughout the entire pregnancy. Assessment and education begins at the first visit and continues throughout the pregnancy. Please do not get confused when you hear EDD or EDC. In your subcomps, it says to know EDC, which is estimated date of confinement. You will also hear EDD, I am sure. This is a synonym for EDC, which is also known as estimated due date. Establishing an accurate due date is one of the most important assessments for a pregnant woman. This EDD represents the anticipated birth date of their child. This provides guidance for the timing of specific maternal and fetal testing throughout pregnancy, gauges fetal growth parameters, and provides well-established timelines for specific interventions in the management of prenatal complications. You should know that most women begin labor within 10 days of their EDC. Again, most women begin labor within 10 days of their EDC. Also know that the estimated due date or estimated date of confinement, you can say, is based on a 40-week gestational age. Checkpoint. 
What is the most reliable measurement of the fetus between 7 and 14 weeks gestation if a patient is unsure of their last menstrual period? The answer is crown rump length. This technique involves measurement of the fetal length from the tip of the cephalic pole to the tip of the caudal pole, so head to tail. The fetus should be at rest in assuming its natural curvature. I'm not going to read this slide, but I just wanted you to be familiar with some terms you might hear while you're in the OB setting. The gravita slash para method. This is the most common method you will see on units. Gravita just means the current total pregnancies, and para is the number of births, and this does include live and stillbirths that reached a viable gestational age. So nothing under 20 weeks is counted, only the births after 20 weeks. Abortions can include spontaneous abortions, SAB, as well as therapeutic abortions, TAB. And then of course, we document the amount of living children. A great example, if there are twins, that is just one added to the gravita portion because it's one pregnancy. But if you include them in the para portion, this would be two because they each have their own birth. Regarding GTPAL, so G is for gravita, gravita with a D. This is how many pregnancies, as I mentioned. T is for how many term births there were. P is for how many preterm births there were. And A is how many abortions. This includes miscarriages, spontaneous, as well as therapeutic abortions. And L stands for living children. Checkpoint. Determine the obstetric history of the following patient. A pregnant patient had three SABs in the first trimester, one newborn who was born at 40 weeks gestation and one newborn who was born at 30 weeks gestation. I'll give you just a moment to think this one through. The answer you should have picked was B. Why, you ask? There are six total pregnancies, and that includes the current pregnancy. So one, the three SABs, that's four, one born at 40 weeks, five, and one born at 30 weeks, six. Regarding the term pregnancies, there is only one here. Regarding the preterm pregnancies, there's only one here. Make sure you remember what term and preterm is gestational wise. Regarding the abortions, there was three SABs, hence the three here. And all said and done, unfortunately, there was only two living children out of this scenario. You should be familiar with Nigel's rule. This is not always the best way to calculate the estimated delivery date for all women. However, it is a good tool to estimate. You do need to keep in mind that the due date does give or take two weeks. Most women deliver within 10 days of their due date, but just keep in mind this is just an estimate. So to do this rule, you're going to take the first day of the last normal menstrual period. So for example, October 14th, 2020, you're going to subtract three from the number of months. So October minus three brings you to July 14th, 2020. You're then going to add seven to the number of days. So that takes you from the 14th to the 21st. And then you're going to adjust the year by adding one year. During the first trimester, so this is conception to 12 weeks, the baby grows from the size of a poppy seed to as big as a roll of film by week 12. Emotionally, during the first trimester, the focus of the mother is on herself, not the fetus. This is when the mother accepts the pregnancy by herself and others and the mother accepts the idea of pregnancy 
and identifies what must be given up to assume this new role. This slide emphasizes the common discomforts during the first trimester. It is important as a nurse to understand these and how to intervene. For example, you need to know this. For example, if a patient is experiencing nausea and vomiting, they should try eating every few hours. Also, know that different solutions work for different patients, so they may have to experiment a little bit. You know, we're all not the same, right? Some people have ginger ale work for them, others may not. Another educational point for new mothers. Sometimes women mistaken urinary frequency for a symptom of a UTI. Yes, it's good to go get worked up for this, of course, but please know that urinary frequency is also a common discomfort in the first trimester. Why? Because you need to know that it is caused by the hormones of pregnancy. So urinary frequency is caused by the hormones of pregnancy. During the second trimester, so this is weeks 13 to 26, the mother develops attachment of great value to her fetus. Family needs to relate to the fetus as a member, and the mother feels the, the sensation of fetal movement, also known as quickening. The mother acknowledges the fetus as a separate entity within her. The mother identifies with the fetus and learns how to delay their own desires. In regard to varicose veins in the legs, you need to know how important education is, especially those who sit a lot and have a desk job. These mothers need to try to get up and move around every hour or so to help their circulation. I would also encourage them to elevate their legs as much as they can. So maybe putting a foot rest out in front of them. During the third trimester, so week 27 to the birth of the newborn, the mother has concern for herself and her fetus as a unit, unconditional acceptance without rejection, longs to hold the newborn, and becomes tired of being pregnant. The mother also questions ability to become a good mother to the newborn. Now listen very carefully to these examples I'm about to go over. These are great education points to those, those mothers experiencing these third trimester discomforts. It's important to educate new mothers how they should avoid lying in the supine position. Once in a supine position, gravity allows the uterus to rest posterior, posteriorly excuse me, onto the spine. The weight of the uterus compresses the inferior vena cava. This results in impeded blood flow and could result in maternal hypotension and also cause some dizzy spells. In regard to heartburn and indigestion, you can always educate your parents to simply remain upright for an hour or two after eating. Why? Because the stomach is displaced upward and is compressed by the large uterus, especially during this trimester. This limits the stomach's capacity to empty quickly. Checkpoint. During the third trimester, what is the thin liquid that comes from the mother's nipples? How would you educate her on this? So this is called colostrum. It's a creamy yellowish breast fluid, and it can typically be expressed or leak from the breast during the third trimester. Not all the time though. This provides great nourishment to the newborn during the first few days of life before that transitions into, you know, breast milk. It's more of a whiter color, not the colostrum that's a yellow color. I would not recommend patients to express this on their own because this can actually induce labor. It's not recommended if the newborn is not ready to be born yet, as this could result in difficulties with the birthing process and cause complications. However, what you can do is to educate the mother to wear breast pads in their bra and change them frequently to prevent buildup, infection, or even excoriation.